Well, it seems that artificial intelligence and machine learning is just about everywhere nowadays. At the one end, you've got uh, large language models like ChatGPT. At the other end, you've got your smartphone and it can blur out the background on a photo or something like that. And just about everything in between. So it's becoming increasingly important to be able to measure the performance of AI or machine learning on different devices. And to that end, Primate Labs, that's the people who brought us uh, Geekbench, have released Geekbench AI. And this is a tool that's able to measure AI performance. However, in using it, what we discover is that measuring AI performance is not an easy task. In fact, once we dive into this, you'll be wishing back for the days where you just had a single core score and a multi-threaded score, and that's all you had to worry about. So if you want to find out more, please, let me explain. Okay, so during this video, we're going to be discovering that testing the AI performance whether that be on a CPU, a GPU, an NPU, is actually a really hard thing to do. You might say, well, that shouldn't be, but Geekbench uh, AI version 1.0 is a very good tool at testing AI, but it also shows us the problems, almost the Wild West situation that we're in right now for testing of AI. So Primate Labs has released Geekbench AI 1.0, a cross-platform benchmarking suite for testing hardware performance and accuracy, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, in an AI-related workflow. A three-score summary based on workload types is given, one score for single precision, 32 bits, one for half precision, that means 16 bits, and one for 8-bit quantized models. And you might think, well, what difference does that make? Well, we'll look at the results. We'll see that actually does make quite a difference and just choosing one over the other wouldn't necessarily give you a clear picture of what's going on. And there's also an accuracy metric for each individual test so that that helps developers and hardware engineers improve everything from efficiency to reliability and so on. And we'll mention that as well. Now, it's worth mentioning at this point that all the models that are used in Geekbench AI have been trained in-house by Primate Labs. That means they know what's in the model. They're able to ensure that the model is fairly used across all platforms and the results, what they put in and what they put out are exactly as expected. So this is not someone else's models. These don't come from Google or Apple or Microsoft. These are all home trained, which costs them quite a lot in terms of money and resources. And then they are able to deploy them across all of the devices. So this is what a score looks like. This is actually for my main laptop, what I'm using here to record this video, what I use to edit this video. I have a review of this laptop here, the MSI GF63 here on this channel. And as you can see, three numbers that are quite different from each other. So this is the 32-bit single precision number. Then this is the half precision number. As you can see here, it's not as good. It's, it's not performing as well using half precision on the CPU. We'll get into all these details why all this is. And then when you've got the 8-bit quantized version, you can see that it's actually faster. So you might think, well, looking at Gary's laptop, we want to use uh, quantized scores all the time. Well, another thing that you get is an accuracy result. And if you look at the one here with Q, that means, so single precision, half precision Q, you can see that already the, uh, look at that, 88%. The quantized version goes down in quality, in accuracy. So you're definitely, generally getting 100% it looks uh, for, there's a couple of more pages of these, it's just the first few lines of it. You generally get 100% for uh, single precision and for half precision, but once you start quantizing the data, think of quantizing as like you take a, uh, a photo and you reduce the resolution. At some point, you're going to get some pixelization, you're going to lose some detail, you're not going to see things clearly. And in fact, you know, you could shrink it back down to almost becomes a, you know, a pixelated kind of 8-bit uh, image from, you know, the days of uh, Commodore 64s and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, retro, that you can do that with data. And as you do that, you lose quality and you lose accuracy. So you can see that here. So that's why it's faster, because it's using 8-bit, but you're not getting the same results. Now, this is what it looks like running under Windows. And the key thing here is there's a drop-down, three drop-down boxes to select different options. So you can select the framework, because there's not just one grand AI framework. Today, maybe we might talk about, you know, kind of 
DirectX or, or something like Vulkan as the graphics driver if you were dealing with 3D gaming. But way back in the day, at the very beginning, there was, you know, uh, OpenGL was used rather than uh, DirectX was being used. And famously, you know, like, what was it? Uh, Doom or Quake wouldn't use one of them. And John Cut, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And it's the same nowadays. There's so many different options for what you can use. So, for example, here on a Windows machine, you've got two different AI frameworks that you can pick from. And then I can pick on whether I, if I'm choosing to run it using DirectML, I can choose to run it on either the built-in Intel graphics I've got in this laptop or the NVIDIA GeForce I've got in this laptop. Um, and as I said, these other ones here are also just, you can pick just CPU as well. And here's the same thing running under an Android phone. So you can kind of, TensorLight Flow is the only framework you can use. But look, you can use CPU, GPU, the built-in NN Neural Network API that's part of Android or Qualcomm's uh, NDK, Neural Network uh, SDK there. So there's all these different options that you can get that will give you different results. So here is a summary of all the different uh, kind of thing. So on Android, there's only TensorFlow Lite and you can use four different backends starting with from the CPU and onwards. Uh, on Linux, they've got one, two, three different sets of uh, AI frameworks, but you can only do it on the CPU. On Windows, there are two different ones. Uh, but you can do it on CPU, GPU, you can do it on DirectML. And then if you've got a Copilot Plus PC, you can use Qualcomm's uh, SDK again. If you're on Apple, you've got Core ML, and then you've got CPU, GPU, and Neural Engine. So try it. There's no real common uh, kind of back end. CPU is definitely common across all the things. You could also say GPU as well. Uh, just missing out Linux there, but you're just using different frameworks and we'll see the different frameworks give you different different results. So these are from my PC. So just running it on the CPU using ONNX uh, framework, then these are the scores you get. And those are the ones I showed you earlier on. But if you change that to open Vino, then you get much higher scores here. Look for single precision, much higher scores there for half precision, and even better scores for quantize. So by moving to a different framework, I'm getting a whole bunch of different uh, performance results. So that would be important if you were a developer thinking about what framework should you support. And then if I move over onto using the GPU, well, I can use the Intel GPU. If I use OpenVINO, then again, I get some very good numbers here. And then if I decide to use DirectML using ONNX, on the Intel CPU, the numbers go down again. So, you know, there isn't just a guarantee that this is the AI performance of any particular device. It does really depend on what you're using. And then if I use the RTX 2050 built into this laptop, I get a whole different bunch of scores. So if we look at those, obviously this is not right. This is a strange result here because the half uh, precision score shouldn't be so low. So that's something to do with the ONNX framework, how it's dealing with that, what internal uh, processing it's doing, it's not working. So that's clear. This is the fastest single precision score I get using the RTX. And this is the fastest half precision score I get. So uh, significantly uh, faster than these other ones here. But notice if I use the quantized version on my uh, NVIDIA GPU, then that's actually less than what you'd get if you use Quantize just using the CPU or the GPU using Open uh, Vino. So again, it's not even just guaranteed to say, well, just use your RTX, you're going to get the best scores. Again, that's not true. And if we now look at, for example, a Snapdragon 8 Gen 3, we can see here the scores for CPU. Okay, they look familiar with those. Single and half are similar, better with quantized. But if you start using the GPU, well, they, the scores go down across the board. So that's not the answer. If you use the NN API, which really should be the way that all kind of uh, neural networks are run on Android, well, the, the, they're even worse. It's just a disaster. So that doesn't help. So then if you use Qualcomm's uh, kit. Well, for single precision, you don't want to do that because you're going to get much, much worse numbers. But clearly for half precision and for quantize, then you do want that because these are much, much different, huge difference here uh, in, in the performance. So, you know, this seems to be a sweet spot. In fact, we're going to see that also in another couple of half of 16 bit or quantize using dedicated hardware seems to be the best thing. Again, we can see exactly the same here with the, the iPhone 
uh, 15 Pro with the Apple A17 Pro. CPU scores okay. Uh, we understand those are the numbers. If you go to GPU, actually, it's worse in one case there, worse there, slightly better there. If you use the neural engine again, worse on 32 bits. So you can clearly see that these, these new NPUs and these neural engines are aimed at 16 bit or 8 bit. And then again, when you go to the 16 bit, then huge difference in uh, performance, a uh, huge uplift in performance. So the problem is, is what do you a target for? Because not all uh, devices are going to have this, this setup. So you know, and then again, a Windows Copilot PC. Well, the CPU, you can get these scores. OK, we can see there. But then the interesting thing, when you use the NPU, again, not necessarily the right thing to do to use 32-bit, though it's giving you similar scores, slightly better than if you're using uh, the CPU. But then again, huge differences when you use half or Quanti 16-bit, basically, or 8-bit. But notice here, you can't use the GPU. So Windows, Microsoft are saying, yes, you can use the CPU and you can use the MPU, but that's all your, your all your choice. Now, if you just compare that to my laptops, this is a Windows Copilot Plus PC with a Snapdragon processor and an NPU in it. These are from my RTX. So look, you can see better numbers for a single precision and uh, better numbers for half percent, 16 bits. So, you know, why do I have to use a, a, a GP, an NPU when I can get the same numbers out of my RTX, uh, but quantize worse? So, you know, it's a real wild west. What what do you choose as a developer to, to what do you choose? What, what configuration do you choose to get the best for your, for consumers? And as consumers, you know, it's a minefield. Do I use any of this for my buying? Uh, decisions when I want to buy my next smartphone, my next PC. Am I using these numbers to try to work out what's the best thing? Very, very difficult. Now, here's some interesting ones. The fastest setup at the time of uh, release is actually, look at this, 32,000, 36,000. If we go back here to what I was seeing here, look, 10,000, 21,000. So these numbers are huge numbers, much, much better numbers. And that's actually using Windows 11 with a Ryzen 7 uh, 7700X, and the important thing is it's using a Radeon RX uh, 7900 XT. So if you're doing that using Direct ML, using the ONNX uh, uh, framework with the Radeon GPU, you're going to get huge scores there. So that's the best uh, at the moment. Now, one thing this does teach us is that TOPS is useless. What's TOPS? TOPS stands for trillions of operations per second. And when people talk about their NPU or their neural engine or their GPU, they're saying we can get this many tops. Well, it quantifies the performance by measuring the number of operations, normally multiply, accumulate operations, because that's the fundamental operation, mathematical operation that's done inside of a neural network. And then how many you can get, you know, how many trillions of those happen within a second. So assuming that you each multiply accumulate operation, uh, a Mac can be performed in one cycle, then basically tops is going to be how many Mac units you've got. OK, uh, times the frequency uh, divided by trillion. So that's basically how you work it out. Uh, but there's a huge gap between this theoretical uh, metric and actual testing. A high top number alone does not guarantee optimal AI performance. Uh, actual performance is a culmination of various factors working in tandem, including the framework, as we've seen, the back end, the precision and the quantization technique that's being used. So back in the day, people used to talk about MIPS. So for, you know, how fast a CPU was working. And again, that was just basically a measure of how long it took to do something, how many clock cycles it took to do something and then many of the instructions per second, that was basically what it was, uh, and then the frequency. So it was pretty useless. Uh, and now TOPS is the same as MIPS. We're going down the same path. History is repeating itself. It's pretty useless. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything because, well, we've just seen all these results are just so varied across all the different platforms and frameworks and everything. So this is a brilliant thing that Geekbench are, I have this tool for testing, but it's really hard. So we have to kind of, hopefully this will coalesce, hopefully there will be some kind of general funneling down of all these different frameworks and all these different ways so that we get kind of down to a few numbers that are more meaningful. But at the moment, if you're compor comparing Core ML to Qualcomm, if you're comparing Qualcomm to 
uh, an NVIDIA RTX running under Windows, it's all going to be very different. So uh, there you go. A lot of work to be done. A lot of work by us as the consumers to understand these things. And uh, But hopefully this is the first time these rings are really being exposed so we can start to talk about them. We can start to talk about them, we can start to analyse them and we can start to understand what's really going on. Now one other thing to mention in closing is that also all of these things there, notice at different times we're using Core ML or we're using Qualcomm's SDK, so it does depend on what the OEM is exposing for third parties as a, you know, I'm sure their camera app or their particular app built into the device gets to fiddle with the hardware at the lowest, lowest level. But what do third party developers get now? Geek Bench AI is working as a third party developer. They don't have any secret source. They don't have any special uh, stuff that they're being given by anybody. They are working using uh, the exposed APIs. And so that is also interesting. As I mentioned, the NN API is actually meant to be the official way of running networking, neural networks on Android, but that doesn't seem to be the way to go at all. So, you know, another important factor. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. And if you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.